probably aware, Nissan has just released their new LMP1 GTR racer. Now, the big news with this that has surprised most people, including myself, is that it's front wheel drive. Now, I've thought a bit about this, I've come up with a few reasons as to why it's front wheel drive, and I'm just going to present them to you now. Now, firstly, before I start, let's just commence with the fact that it's not actually front wheel drive. More power is available in the rear axle than the front axle. It just is that the petrol power is going to the front axle, so that's your constant power around the Mars circuit. And the hybrid power only, so just the electric, is going to the rear axle. Now firstly, let's talk about why front wheel drive is bad in an open race car class and why you would ideally not want to use it. Now, if we had to consider our basic car, like this, and we now consider it accelerating. So that is, the wheels are providing force in the forward direction. So in the eventuality that's front wheel drive, the wheel is pushing back on the tarmac that way, propelling the car forwards, okay, there's net force forwards. Now, obviously, any car that isn't working on essentially a slot car track has to have a CG that is higher than the floor. So that's the center of gravity. So if we assume the center of gravity is located up here, as this accelerates forward, this is pushing the car forward, right? But the mass is trying to hold it back. So we get an essential force that we can approximate as acting on the center of gravity, pushing backwards. This creates a rotation force, uh, known as a torque. And this will mean that the force on the rear wheels under acceleration will be increased, the vertical force, and the force on the front wheels will be decreased. Now, as you may know from some of my previous videos, grip can be approximated as FR equals mu N. This N being the normal force on the tire. Now, obviously there's variations in mu, but for the sake of this, let's keep it simple. Now, we can see that as the normal force is being decreased by this weight transfer to the rear, we're going to have proportionally less relative grip on our front wheels than our rear wheels than what we had before. In the same way that under braking, you experience more grip on the front wheels than the rear. And that is why you shift your brake bias forwards, even in a car that can be rear heavy. Now, of course, this means that as you're accelerating in a straight line, you'll always be able to accelerate faster than a rear wheel drive car, than a front wheel drive car, for a given level of equal grip on both. Of course, all wheel drive can accelerate even faster than this because it can utilize the grip on both sets of wheels. And theoretically, if you have enough power, can accelerate as fast as you brake. Now, let us consider the cornering scenario. If we consider the car driving through the corner, now, as we come into the corner, we brake, we turn in, we transfer our force from being longitudinal, acting along the length of the car backwards, to being lateral across the length of the car, that is the tires. Now, we want as much lateral grip as possible, everyone probably knows that. But then as we power out of the corner, we then are needing to transfer that grip back into the longitudinal axis to accelerate out. Now, all cars struggle with this feature because they have a big acceleration force on the tires and the tires are having to fight back with a big force that way, right? So the tires are quite heavily loaded. If you then try to accelerate these tires, you're going to put a force on them again. And if you think about a tire as having a grip circle of lateral force and longitudinal force, for any given point, you can only select a certain amount of total force, okay? Now, this means that if we're accelerating, we have less lateral grip. Now, combine that with what I said before about the weight transferring to the rear, and we see that we have less grip on the front than the rear when exiting a corner. Now combine that with adding power on the front and you'll inherently end up with understeer. All front wheel drive cars will inherently understeer under power compared to their non-powered condition. And this is a problem with front wheel drive cars. If you want more detail, I can explain it in another video. Now, clearly Nissan has found a way around this if they're to remain competitive in Le Mans, which obviously they wouldn't have designed a race car if they weren't thinking that it was competitive. Now, there's several reasons that could be this. Now, I read in an article, a quote from the technical director, 
that was talking about the aerodynamics packaging. Now, of course, having an engine in the rear is not good for aerodynamics. Ideally, of course, we want to start our diffuser for our floor as early as possible. Now, the rear engine configuration of many or miles cars prevents this from happening because you have to have the floor flat at, flat at the rear because you want the engine to be as low as possible to keep that center of gravity down. Now, if we consider a relatively ideal floor shape, this being the underfloor of the car, the profile, so you'll have to forgive me for being a bit abstract here, the flow is coming from this way, or in other ways, this is staying still and the car is moving that way, so the nose of the car, tail of the car. We can see that once we start putting in suspension and other componentry here, wheels, you can see that drive shafts, motors, all that sort of things go there, and they intersect with this ideal floor profile. So as a result of the engine, we have to instead keep the floor flat for longer, and we have to kick it up later. Now, this means a less sufficient floor and not ideal aerodynamics. In Nissan's case, they don't have the engine at the rear, so they can start that transition smoother on the floor, and they can also bring the top down earlier, and it's a clever way of doing that. Now, originally when I first heard of it being front wheel drive, I thought it was a rules workaround. I had in my mind the rule from 2013 that you could only apply electric power to your front wheels at speeds above 120 k's an hour. However, I looked it up and that was actually eliminated in 2014. So if that rule was in existence, it would have been a clever way of working around it because your electric engine would be at the rear and your petrol engine would be at the front constantly powering it so you could have full power to all wheels at any speed. But that's not the case, so don't worry about that. What it may be a more useful thing for though is the newer fuel flow regulations. They limit their fuel now. So they've always limited fuel, but now they're limiting it quite tightly so that you can only use a certain max level of fuel. If you think about the fuel demands around a circuit, you don't need power when you're braking. There's plenty of opportunities when you don't need maximum power. Now, if you think about this, if we consider the circuit distance along here and the power demand along there, we can think of a car's power demand being quite erratic. You may call for an acceleration, it may go up, throttles off for braking, things like that. It can be all over the place, right? But if you are limited on your instantaneous fuel burn rate, then you want to make this average. You want to be burning fuel at the maximum rate allowed. So if you consider a line here that's the average of all this, you want to try and do this. And this is in essence what hybrid systems allow you to do. By storing and recovering your electrical energy, you can basically smoothen out this curve and make it easier. This is running a very large hybrid system and that means they actually have a huge amount of power available at the rear wheels. I can't remember the exact figures but I believe it was something like 700 horsepower at the rears compared to 500 and something at the fronts, don't quote me on it, but I remember it being more for the rears than the fronts. Now this means that when you want to deploy your big power, when you're coming out of corners, things like that, when you want to get that power going to the rear, you can go and you can push as hard as you want with that big electric motor and front wheel drive isn't an issue because you've got the power at the back anyway, you're essentially all wheel drive. But it doesn't stop there. See, when you're going down the straight, if you think about it, front wheel drive is a disadvantage once you're above the speed where your front wheels will be slipping. Now, obviously with the big power figures we're seeing here, this could be at quite a high speed that you're still getting wheel spin or slip with front wheel drive. But you gotta think about the way in which power is actually applied to the road. Many people consider power on cars as torque times the rotational speed of the engine, okay? But it really makes a lot more sense in our context to instead consider it as a linear fashion, as the car having a net power. Consider the power of the tires against the road itself. Now, if you think of that as power equaling instead a linear fashion of force, times velocity, we can now look at the problem of straight line power consumption. Now, we can see here that as the velocity goes up, the force goes down if the power is held constant. Now, in the case of our car, let's assume that it's producing peak power at all times. Now, we can see that if we're making that power, as we go faster, we have less force available at the tires. Therefore, we're going to see 
less and less wheel slip as we get to a faster and faster speed because we're just losing out on that force. Now, that means that as we're traveling in a straight line, if we're powering the fronts or the rears, it doesn't matter as long as we're going fast enough that neither is slipping. And this is a key thing here. You can have your electrics to burst you out of the corner and get you up to speed as rapidly as possible, but then you don't need to worry about necessarily getting the power to those rear wheels as you're going in a straight line. You can have it going to the front. It doesn't make a difference. Now, of course, many people say that cars with front heavy weight distributions tend to understeer. Now, this is a misconception because you can produce a front heavy car that doesn't understeer. You can produce a front heavy car that has radical oversteer. It's all in how you set it up. And the thing is, is that with the Nissan car is that it has much wider fronts than rears. Again, I can't remember the specifics on the tires, but I think it's something like a 14 inch front and a nine inch rear. So big differences we're talking here. Now, the main thing that will help with is, is that they have their weight very far forward. Now let me draw you up a quick car again. Now, if we consider that the car's center of gravity is not in fact in the center, the weight is shifted forwards. We can see that all it means is that we need to apply more relative force here than here to turn the car in. Now, the thing is that if you think about this, go back to our previous equation. FR equals mu n. Now, if we consider that, we can see that mu, for now let's assume it's constant, times the normal force will increase at the front. Because the center of gravity is further forward, we're going to see a bigger force downwards from the way of the car here than here. So naturally, inherently, the car is going to be balanced assuming mu was constant because the relative force of grip increases here as the CG moves forward. Now, we all know that that's not 100% true. And the reason that is is that because you end up with tire curves and things like that. I'm not going to go into that in detail here. If you want that, another video. But the thing is that by running the wider tires at the front, we can assist with that problem. We can make it a lot better. We can basically keep this mu in check so that we end up with a balanced car. Now, that also will help with the, the tire temperature as well because depending on where the weight is, you need to match your tires to match that because you want the tires at the right temperature. Force is higher, you need a wider tire or your tires will overheat. Rear force is lower, you need a narrower tire or they won't get up to 10. Now, of course, when we bring aerodynamics into the equation, this becomes an even better scenario. When we consider an ideal on the track, okay? an ideal I'm talking here, not realistic. Ideal on the trace often have the center of pressure further forward than where your center of gravity may necessarily lie. Now, of course, in the case of this car, the center of gravity is further forward. Now, we ideally want our center of pressure to line up perfectly with the center of gravity. Because if that's the case, then it means that the car will have consistent and predictable handling. We don't want the effective grip center moving about depending on the speed, and that's what will happen. If we have the pressure center here, as we increase speed, we'll get radically more grip on the rear than the front understeery car. Now, if we extrapolate that, most cars have to work around their diffusers to try, and their under trays, and their entire aero package for that matter, to try and shift their center of pressure rear to where their center of gravity is. Now, Nissan doesn't have this problem because their center of gravity is already forward, where the center of pressure ideally wants to sit. Now, this means that overall they can optimize their aerodynamics much better. And this is something that I believe they talked about in their press release, but I don't think they really went into any detail. And this is the reason behind why it's good. So the combination of the aero packaging to enable them to get closer to an ideal floor and run that tighter packaging on the rear and the ability to match the CG and the center of pressure nicely as well. Finally, let's not forget that racing is a marketing exercise. Now, if you just went along with the flow, do what everyone else is doing, you're not really gonna stand out. Now, Nissan is going to want to stand out here. They want to make an impression because they're coming back to Le Mans they want to be something special. And obviously that was when they were in the, um, the old prototype, well, not the old prototype, the more recent experimental classes of things like the Delta Wing. And that was something different and it got media's attention, it got people's attention. And this car is something different. 
And you gotta remember that even if it doesn't work, it's still a marketing success for them. So that's all for me today. Uh, thank you for watching. Please remember that this stuff is largely my opinion. I'm working off everything I know, but I obviously can't actually see the very inner workings of the design, so take everything you say with a grain of salt. Um, again, thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and hopefully I'll see you next time.